You don't know this, because I haven't told you this, but I'm going to tell you now, and it can be a secret among us and all of Zoom. <laughs> My favorite movie is Mean Girls. I, I hear the giggles, yes, yes. And, you know, it, it, it's not just that it's a lovely teen dramedy that came out at precisely the right time in my life. It's a movie about so much more. But let me, let me tell you the story first. I should always begin with the story first, shouldn't I? I was about 18 years old, just finished my first semester in college when this movie came out. I didn't have cable at the time. It wasn't well advertised even. So I had no clue that this movie had been released. But it was just after Thanksgiving, and my, my friends decided, hey, let's get together. We should all watch Mean Girls. I, I don't, what, what is this movie? I don't want to see this. I don't want to watch this. I, I grew up watching Lindsay Lohan. I, I, I knew enough. It was only a few moments before I was transfixed. The, the movie was inflammatory. It had fundamentalists. It had people who didn't know how the US high school system worked. It had the suburbs. It had everything. <laughs> it had absolutely everything. And by the time I had finished watching, I was a convert. I love this movie. I still, to this day, know every line of this movie. <laughs> In college, I dubbed a scene of it into French with a partner for a class project. I love the movie Mean Girls. It has everything. Now, one of the things that people don't always realize about the movie is though, although Tina Fey wrote the screenplay, it's based on a sociological text, Queen Bees and Wannabes by Rosalind Wachtrild. Um, and she's writing about, essentially about a recurring theme that happens in the movie, the politics of girl world, or essentially how young women are socialized to treat one another extremely negatively, all in pursuit of male attention and affection. And so some of these behaviors we see demonstrated in the movie are like pretending to be dumb at math um, or, you know, making sure that you dress in the most revealing Halloween costume. This is all part of the sociological research. And we see at the end of the movie some of the exercises that Tina Fey as a teacher in the movie, as an advanced level math teacher, does are things that the author of the sociological text, Queen Bees and Wannabes, recommends. These are about healing, bringing the community back together. But I really want to focus on the beginning of the movie. Fairly early on, Katie, our protagonist, or maybe even our anti-hero, she, she is not so great by the end of the movie, but she's kind of innocent at the beginning, is entering the high school cafeteria for the very first time. And she is trying to figure out where to sit. We have this panning shot of all the different tables. We've got the jocks. We've got the performing arts kids. Uh, we've got the group that she eventually joins, the, the plastics, the elite girl squad of the high school. But also, there's a poignant moment that is often glossed over very quickly, a table of unfriendly black hotties. These are black young women who are a-list in their own segment of the high school world, but still haven't reached the predominantly white A-list level that we see with the plastics. And this was interesting for me because the first couple times I watched it, I remember thinking to myself, oh, that's funny. And then it kind of, it got into me. It, it hooked me by the soul. It hooked me in the bones. It hooked me in the DNA that Matthew talks about in that stuff that our ancestors left us. And all of a sudden, I had to remember my own experiences of the high school lunchroom. Now, my, my high school wasn't very large. I went to a very small private school. 
But all that means is you have all of these social circles jumbled up into fewer bodies. They're all still there. I ate lunch with the same people for most of my four years of high school, except for when I was mad at them. <laughs> and on those days when I was mad at them, right as rain, I could always go to the black table. There was always a black table. Every high school that has ever high schooled has a table where people who feel marginalized can go and just let loose a little bit. The conversation flowed more easily at the black table, even if I hadn't been there for weeks and weeks and weeks. Occasionally, especially during Black History Month, we might ask a teacher to host the black table and we would go to a classroom during lunch and share Popeyes we were trying to embrace all of our black identity. But this is a phenomenon, these lunch table segregations that we see in high school after high school, in workplace after workplace, that we hear about most directly in Dr. Beverly Tatum's Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Spoiler alert, her thesis is actually, why doesn't anyone ever ask why all the white people are sitting together too? Right? We, we keep doing these things where we self-segregate for a variety of reasons. And I think one of the things that this points out, especially if we look at the flip side of these coins, that there is a black table because there are also so many white tables, or there is a Micronesian table because there are so many other tables that are unwelcoming or unaware of that particular cultural expression, it reveals the one thing that we know about anti-blackness in particular. More than I am black because so many of us here in the sanctuary and online are white, whiteness depends on my being black. If there is no counterpoint to the white supremacist structure, the whole house of cards topples very, very quickly. So we look at ways to hyperfixate on blackness and black people. We look at ways to put black people at the bottom of the social hierarchy. And from this pulpit, I have said sometimes that black is a social construct, right? So it doesn't always mean black skin, right? It can mean whoever is at the bottom of a system in a given context. In this month of interdependence, in this Black American History Month, I want us to stick a little bit more literally because we don't always spend as much time there as I'd like. So we look at the ways that we can have some distance from blackness instead of looking at the actual cultural erasure that whiteness and white supremacy show to us and represent. This is important because nobody comes from white land, right? No one's culture is white, okay? Everyone had some other cultural context before we created the concept of whiteness, most directly, but not exclusively, around 1631 as a result of Bacon's Rebellion. We were looking for a way to divide the European indentured servants from those of different origins, especially black Africans, right? So when we hear in the movie Mean Girls about unfriendly black hotties, there's two things that are going on there at the same time. There is a lack of awareness of why People who are trying to mind their own business at our own table might be unfriendly to people who are trying to get in when we're dealing with the when we're dealing with the onslaught, when we're dealing with the pains of a world turned upside down by white supremacy day in, day out, sometimes inside of our own homes, or even worse, sometimes inside of our own heads. And this signaling specifically that they're black as a way of making sure these are a group of people who are not the theater kids, right? They are not the top of the social hierarchy. They are not the jocks. Blackness itself is totalizing. That's curious. 
That's curious because it, again, shows us one of the ways that racism and anti-blackness in particular work. There is something about the identity of blackness, about the ability to easily see my skin tone that allows us to create a system of value judgments, a system of oppression, a system that says that no matter what you are, first and foremost, and before anything else, you are black. This integrates how you might talk, how you might feel about things, what your political opinions are. It's strange the way that blackness, which again, doesn't actually fully represent all black peoples, not all black peoples are most directly from Africa. Black peoples are always multicultural, both in our beings and in our actual makeup as people who have had families from time to time to time. We see this in the former blood quanta categories that we see all around the world, but also in the US. We, we created the great system of eugenics and then pushed it outward. So we were the ones that were pushing the most theory and then other people took it and kind of sinisterly perfected it in ways that we know both from the events of the Holocaust, as well as events in Australia that went on to the late 1970s, right? This is all part of the same relation. But let's bring back, instead of global racism, let's focus a little bit more on anti-blackness. We need to define that term, right? Anti-blackness is a specific form of racism that places people with black skin, people who have ancestry on the African continent, which is all of us, but again, more immediately, at the bottom of systems of social hierarchy, it makes us the victim of systems of oppression because the system depends on our subjugation. And so when we're watching Mean Girls, one of the things that we can see is not only does it represent the particular prejudices and stereotypes of 2004 when it came out, it's a truly incisive look at the intersectionality of all of that, uh, the understanding that it is hard to be more than one thing in a society that wants you to be one and only one thing as well as an understanding that while we do not all benefit from anti-blackness, all of us can play a role in upholding it, challenging it, and dismantling it, right? I have just as much power to keep the system of anti-blackness in place as a black person when I remain silent or don't work against it, Right? If we're not actively against something, silence is consent in this case. The new musical based on the Broadway that was Broadway musical that was based on the original movie itself, how many degrees removed can we get there? It's like the producers, right? We, we have the movie, then it becomes a Broadway musical, then we make a movie of the Broadway musical. This happens from time to time does some really creative casting where now they have diversified the cast, again, to point out the fact that anti-blackness does not need only white people to perpetuate it, but that we can all play a role in upholding that system. And so while we learn some strategies in the movie, and I'm gonna wrap us up right here because I want us to play with some of these themes for the rest of the month, we're left with a couple different things when we think about interdependence as it relates to blackness and anti-blackness in particular. One of them is that whiteness depends on blackness, not the other way around. That we need to interrogate a system that totalizes all of one's identity and connect to cultural roots that sometimes have resistance embedded in them, and that once again, we all have a role 
in the systems of anti-blackness, of upholding them, challenging them, and ultimately working to dismantle them. That is as interdependent as it gets. And that is the way that we move forward. Amen. Amen. Ashe and blessed be.